USA in your America is asking you to call Drive you Through the USA America's the greatest land of all On a highway or a road along a levee Performance is sweeter Nothing can beat her Life is completer in a So make a date today To see the USA To see it in your In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. But we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. All right, folks, today we're getting deep with Anthony Peake, author of books such as Is There Life After Death, The Outer Body Experience, and the recently released Labyrinth of Time, The Illusion of Past, Present, and Future. He's also championed the cheating the ferryman hypothesis, which is quickly gaining steam as a possible explanation for the nature of the human experience. He blows more minds than the U.S. military, and for the next hour, I'm just going to try to keep it together. Anthony, sir, thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. I love that line. That's absolutely superb. <laughs> right. I've never been introduced in that way before, so so that's pretty pretty great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, uh, let's paint a picture for the people. How did you get started writing about such subjects, and have your theories on reality evolved since you started? Yeah, it's um, it's an intriguing and interesting story in the sense that um, I'm a, I'm a sociologist, historical sociologist by background and by degree, and then I did postgrad at the London School of Economics in in labour law and industrial relations. So quite a different from the area I write about. Um, but what happened was around about 10, 11 years ago, um, I was in the fortunate position that I'd done a fairly lucrative contract and um, I had a little bit of spare cash and something had been driving me for around about six months before to write a book. Now, I know most people, you know, we all have this urge to write a book and I decided, well, why don't you just do it instead of actually sitting back and thinking about it, write a book. The problem was I didn't know sure. what on earth I was going to write about, but my wife was was willing to allow me um, some time off from my normal work, uh, to spend a little bit of time just thinking through what I was going to write. And the very first day that I decided to start writing, I literally was sitting in front of a blank computer screen thinking, OK, what are you going to write about then? Are you going to write fiction, nonfiction? What are you going to do? And quite a curious thing happened because I started to um, sense something was about to happen. Now, I suffer from what is known as classical migraine. And classical migraine, for the people out there that have this experience, is it's not the normal type of migraine in the sense that you don't necessarily get a headache. But what you do get is something called an aura which is a, a sensation. Now, with me, what happens is my fingers start to go a bit numb um, and my lips start to tingle and I start to go slightly blind. I get what's called a scotoma in my eyes. It's kind of a break of, Jesus. of, of your, your eyesight. So when I'm driving and I get these things, I have to stop the car because I can't drive. And I know that it's going to go away after about half an hour or so. But this time round, something also very curious took place is that I had the overwhelming sensation that I had sat in front of that computer screen, looking out of the view of my, my house then in Horsham in West Sussex over here in the UK. And I'd done it before. And it was overpowering. The sensation was absolutely overpowering that at some time in my past, I had done this. Now, this is an experience I'd, I'd had many times before, but never as powerful as this, because it's clearly something that a lot of people recognize. It's, it's deja vu. Sure. And when I came out of the, the aura state, I was relieved to find that a headache didn't develop, but I had my subject. I thought, I'll write a book about deja vu. So I started looking on the web to, to find information, as you do. Um, and I was surprised to discover that, that there had only been a handful of books written on the subject. 
And nobody had really got to grips with exactly what was happening when you had a deja vu sensation. Um, and quite by chance, I came across an academic paper written by a guy called Dr. Arthur Funkhauser, who is an American guy who lives in Switzerland. Uh, his actual PhD is in, is in quantum physics, ironically enough, but he actually practices as a younger, Jungian psychotherapist or psycho psychotherapist over there. And Art's paper was an attempted explanation for deja vu. And Art's explanation was called the dream theory of deja vu. And in this, he suggests that the reason you have a deja vu sensation is because you have recently had a dream. And the dream is of a future event. But you forget about it, as we do with dreams. We just forget dreams, don't we? You, know, you, you, don't, you don't remember them most of the time. But what yeah. he argued was that we subliminally remember them. And when we start to experience the events that we dreamed, we feel that we're reliving them again. We feel that we've had an experience of this before. Now, I got in contact with Art about this, um, and he was, he was wonderful. He responded, and I said, this intrigues me because what you're suggesting here is something that is completely non-scientific. You're suggesting recognition. Because effectively, if you have a dream of an event that's about to take place, that is a precognition. And of course, modern science just doesn't accept precognitions as being, a, a, you know, it's just something that doesn't happen. The future hasn't happened yet. So therefore, how can you know about it? So I started off on a loop there about this. And I started looking into the, 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 the theories of um, deja vu as a phenomenon. I came across a concept called the Ephron thesis. Um, which effectively is the explanation you'll find in most neurological books. And that is that um, effectively we have two sections to our brain, the dominant hemisphere and non-dominant hemisphere. And effectively the issue there was simply that um, one part of your brain had processed a piece of visual information before the other. And indeed your non-dominant hemisphere had processed it. And when it crossed what's called the corpus callosum, to your dominant hemisphere, your dominant hemisphere effectively got the information to get the information twice. However, um, I have found out comparatively recently that this particular hypothesis, which is called the visual pathways theory, has been uh, completely blown out the water by research by a guy called Dr. Akira O'Connor, who is at the Deja Vu Research Unit in the University of Leeds over here in the UK. And they found that people who had been born blind and had never seen anything, actually have deja senti. They actually have deja sensations of recognition really? for hearing, which is amazing, isn't it? So they hear something yeah. twice. Now, this apparently blows the whole Ephron thesis out of the water because the neurological pathways for hearing are completely different to the neurological pathways for the human eyes. So the phenomenon clearly is not explained. So what I did was I started reading up about the neurology and then quite by chance came across um, why I'd had the deja vu sensation. And it seems that deja vu or deja sensations are linked to migraine. In fact, there's an amazing book called Migraine written by Dr. Oliver Sacks, um, a, a British psychiatrist who lives in New York and written a series of books on unusual mental states. And in this, in this book on migraine, he points out that um, one of the aura states that are reported by people that have migraine are de profound deja vu sensations. And in the book, he describes quite a few precognitive deja vu experiences that people have. So clearly, this was linked to my, my migraine. I then found that although my deja vu sensations are strong, they are not the strongest you can have. And the strongest you can have is when you have you experience a particular neurological state called temporal lobe epilepsy. Now, this is epilepsy that's focused on the temporal lobes of the brain, and it is qualitatively different to normal sorts of epilepsy in that people who have temporal lobe epilepsy or experience this have profound altered states of consciousness during their aura states before they have a full seizure, if indeed they do, because many of them just have what's called petty malabsences, where they just stir at you for a few seconds. And what I found was that these guys have, they fall, they fall out of time, time slows down for them, they have the feeling that there's another presence with them, 
Uh, they, they have sensations of snippets of their past lives. They, they feel hyper-religious. They feel that there's significance in the things around them. Now, I started looking up on temporal lobe epilepsy, and I was amazed to discover that in ancient times it was known as the diviner's disease, because these people were known to be able to predict the future. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, is there a link here? And I looked into the neurology, and I found that there's a particular neurotransmitter in the brain called glutamate. And glutamate is responsible for, for migraine. It's responsible for temporal lobe epilepsy or elements of it. And it's also responsible for schizophrenia. Now, I then started to think about this, and I thought schizophrenia seems to be an extreme form of, of temporal lobe epilepsy in the sense that whatever they're perceiving becomes so real that they lose their ability to even appreciate what is reality and what isn't. I then found, and this is when things then fell into place, because I found that there is another phenomenon that also involves glutamate, and this is near-death experience. You know, this is the report that people claim that just before, if they're about to die or they're in a car crash or they have cardiac arrest or whatever, they feel that they, 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 they have these sensations of floating out of the body. They have sensations of going towards a light. They have sensations of meeting a being of light. And they have a sensation that time slows down. Now, you will recall many people who report having near-death experiences will claim and they'll say, my life flashed before my eyes. And it suddenly started to fall into place because I just considered and I thought this and I thought, my life flashed before my eyes. These people have precognitive abilities. A precognition is seeing the future. What if you're not seeing the future when you're having a deja vu sensation, but you're remembering the past? if that makes sense. Yeah. Because I suddenly thought, what about a scenario that at the point of death, we, we fall out of time? I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, no, it's that's cool. Um, we fall out of time. And because people turn around and say that, you know, my life flashed before my eyes, but they also say that time slows down. People under great times of stress claim this. I know people who've fallen off horses, people who've skydiving, mountain climbers. They all report this sensation of time slowing down. Sure. So I pulled it together and I thought, imagine a scenario that you're about to die and the glutamate, and it is a known phenomenon, glutamate in times of stress floods the brain. And we know that glutamate slows down your perception of time. Now imagine you're just about to die. You're in a car, you're about to hit a wall, say. The glutamate flood hits, and what does it do? It slows down your perception of time. Now, people claim that their life flashed before their eyes, and I thought, imagine a scenario that time is slowed down to such an extent that what is a split second to other people could be a whole lifetime. What if, in that lifetime, you live your whole life in a matrix-like recreation of your life, minute by minute, in which case, rather like Thomas Anderson in the movie um, The Matrix, before he became Neo, he is blissfully unaware of the fact that he's trapped in a matrix and he's actually in some form of that, and he's, he's experiencing life through a computer program. Mm -hmm. he, couldn't, he doesn't know. But there will be occasions when something strange will happen, where you'll think, I've done this before. And I think that's a deja vu sensation. I think a deja vu sensation, or technically deja vu, already lived, is that this is exactly what it says on the tin. It's exactly what the sensation feels like, that you're remembering something. Because there are cases where individuals um, I've now interviewed who have profoundly precognitive deja vu sensations. They, they know what's going to happen for the next two or three minutes. So clearly it's not just a vague recognition of the future. It's, it's actually knowing what's going to happen. And indeed there is a young man who contacted me after my first book came out and he has a tumor on his pineal, gray, gray, uh, pineal gland in his brain, which is interesting because my next book is going to be on the pineal gland, by the way, and dimethyltryptamine nice. and, and altered states of consciousness. 
So I'll be focusing in on that. If we get the chance, I'll talk a little bit about that. But the intriguing thing here is that this young man, who is now doing his PhD in astrophysics, he's, he's a bright lad, he tells me that when he has deja vu sensations, he knows what's going to happen for the next two minutes. He's in this complete flux state where he in his mind, when somebody's speaking to him, he says the words just before they say them in his head. And I said to him, why, Chris, why don't you um, tell somebody that you know what they're going to do? And he said something profoundly interesting. He said, I can't. And I said, why not? And he said, well, think about it. If somebody's going to say something and I say to them, I know what you're going to say, they don't say it. They say something different, in which case I've changed the future. By my action, I've actually made the future different to the future as it was, which is intriguing because then I then moved on from this uh, in the first book. And it's one of the things I, I, I talk about in the book in great detail is that I do the neurology of how these memories are stored within the brain. And indeed, my latest books develop this. And I think the memories are actually pulled up by the brain from something called a zero point field, uh, the quantum vacuum. And I think that every record of every event that's ever taken place is in the quantum vacuum. And again, we can come back to that later. So the idea is that when you're living your life, you're not the only person that's recorded your life. Now, think about this for a second. You may have come across something called the Everett's Many Worlds Interpretation of Particle Physics. This suggests that literally the universe splits into identical copies of itself millions of times a second and has been doing since the first moments of the Big Bang. This is one of the only solutions they have for the observation of certain behaviors of certain subatomic particles. Again, I won't go into details, but in my book, I go into the details of why the twin slit experiment, why Schrodinger's cat, um, why the EPR paradox and many other quite esoteric um, quantum physics things that are known by quantum physicists, but are not generally known by the general public are so intriguing. But effectively, what I'm, I'm saying is, is that there are literally trillions of, of Greg's and Anthony's having this conversation. So there are literally, there are trillions of Greg Colwoods. Each one of them will lay down the record of a life that will be subtly different from another one. So in which case, in time, there will be a record, a database, if you will, of every single event coming from every single decision that you make through the whole of your life. So here you are in this kind of matrix-like recreation of your life in the final seconds of your life, and you're living it again. But this time round, there is a part of you that knows you're living it again. And I call this the daemon. It's your higher self. It's your spirit guide. It's your guardian angel. It's many, many things. And if you look through history, um, this being has been known for centuries. Socrates had a daemon. It, it, it's quite intriguing how popular this idea is. Now, this daemon knows the future because it's the part of you that remembers the fact that you lived the life before. Now, I don't know if you or your listeners play um, RPG games on the computer, you know, first person shoot 'em ups or you things like, um, I don't know, the, the Lara Croft thing, Tomb Raider. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... OK, so you watch, you, you've got Lara Croft. I mean, she's really designed to follow her all the time, isn't she? With something to do with her physical shape, I think. And <laughs> you're following Lara Croft round through the corridors. You're playing the game for the first time. And Lara comes along. And she comes round the corner and there's this bloody big monster and it comes over and it kills her. What happens is you then reboot the game and you go back to the start of the game and you have Lara going down the same corridor. But this time, you know, there's going to be a monster around the corner. So what you do is you either make sure that Lara is prepared for it with a weapon, or she goes in another route. I think this is what happens in real life. I think that what happens is that you're living your life and your daemon remembers the events of your last life where you were injured or you were killed. And it will try to warn you to make sure that you don't make the same mistake you made last time round. Now, this is why people report time and time again that they hear a voice in their head that warns them not to do something. They have an inkling and a feeling that something feels wrong. 
Some people will say that they get pushed and pulled in certain directions. Now, interestingly enough, on Facebook, literally today, because um, I did another interview last night and I mentioned this then, I've had three or four people contact me on Facebook and post on my Facebook wall events that happened to them exactly as I'm describing it now, that literally something made them stop doing something that would have ended up in their death. Now. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, now 30% of people in the world never, ever experience deja vu. 70% of people do. Those 30% are living their lives for the first time. And they are what I call Eidolons. This is the lower self. So the Laura Croft on the screen is an Eidolon. The daemon is the game player. Okay. But the difference is in reality, for want of a better term, is the game player can't move the body of the sprite on the screen. The sprite moves itself. It's more analogous to being in a car. And the Eidolon is the driver. And the daemon is the passenger. The daemon can only warn and advise, but it can't change you physically moving your body, except on, on the very, very curious circumstances. For instance, sometimes where people have split brain operations and such like. So this is how these warnings occur. This is how the daemon is precognitive. And this is why, and it is fascinating this, that the older we get, the incidence of deja and the reason for this, if you think about it, if you apply my hypothesis, is perfectly reasonable. Because as you go through life, there's going to be more times where your daemon will have an opportunity to effectively save you from an event and effectively turn you off one road or down a, wrong, a corridor that's completely new. So the daemon won't remember it either, and neither will you. So you won't have deja vu sensations because you're living a brand new life. Now, this overall concept is very much in the zeitgeist now, because if you think about some of the movies that have been out in, in the last 10 or 15 years that deal with this subject, um, I'm, I'm thinking about Groundhog Day, living the same day over and over again, because in my hypothesis, I argue at the end of the second life, you do it again and again and again, just like uh, um, Phil Connors in the movie Groundhog Day does. In fact, as an interesting aside, the, um, the writer of Groundhog Day, a guy called Danny Rubin, who's an academic at Harvard, has given copies of my first book to virtually all his friends because he said this guy's awesome. on the science of Groundhog Day. In fact, I'll be interviewing Danny on my own radio station um, in January next year when we'll be talking about the background to why he wrote Groundhog Day the way he did. So that's the overall model of the first book. Is there life after death, the extraordinary science of what happens when you die? So that's how I started to get into writing. The second book, The Daemon, was um, an, an, an expansion on this idea of this duality, this Daemon and Adelon idea. And I go into the neurology. I, I cite a lot of examples of people who read my first book, which, by the way, now has sold around about 37,000 copies worldwide and been translated into foreign languages and everything. Because cause it resonates with so many people. Because people yeah, it's, and they, it's awesome. Go, crimes, this guy isn't. You know, I'd never thought about it that way, but it makes sense. Okay. So the Damon and the Adelon book, the Damon book describes all that. My third book is then dealing with the elements of time and time perception. And how it is that time can slow down under certain circumstances and why it does this neurologically. Because one of the philosophies I've always had is, is that, and it's not my original line, the original line was cited by an Italian researcher, and Carl Sagan is famous for using the line, is that extraordinary claims need extraordinary proofs. So when people read my books, you will find that every single thing I reference is referenced back to original academic papers. It's referenced back to the source material. There is nothing in my books that I don't invite my readers to go back and check for themselves, you know, because it's profoundly important. You know, I'm not somebody who's pretending I'm channeling information from the planet Tharg. I'm not somebody right. that's in tune with aliens. I'm not somebody that claims to be a reincarnation of somebody else. I'm just an ordinary guy with an extraordinary idea. Um, and this is why the idea has resonated with so many people. Because of that, you know, it's it's and we call the overall concept it lad, which is just the initials of is there life after death? And then there are 
thousands of people around the world now who call themselves Itladians, which are the people that are interested in applying this model to their lives. So that's where we are at the moment. There's three books I've written so far. There's a fourth book I've edited on the near-death experience with um, a pair of Australian consultant psychiatrists, um, which is a book on near-death experience for clinicians, um, how they identify what a near-death experience is and how they work with it. Um, and the book I'm researching now, which I think is going to pull it all together in the most phenomenal way, is... Um, a model that in my, there was, oh, of course, there's another book I'd forgotten about there, The Out-of-Body Experience. How could I have forgotten that? I've had so many books out recently. And The Out-of-the-Body Experience is a scientific and cultural analysis of circumstances where people claim that they physically leave their body and wander around in three-dimensional space. And in this book, I deal with out-of-the-body experiences, lucid dreaming, which is the most phenomenal thing to experience whereby you are dreaming and you suddenly become aware of the fact you are dreaming. In fact, it's the, the premise that the movie Inception was based upon. Sure. Do you know any good techniques to induce lucid dreaming? Um, I know a few in the sense that um, I'm in contact with one or two of the world's leading experts on the subject, people like Robert Wagner, for example. Um, and one of the, the one or two techniques, the, be the best movie to watch on this, funnily enough, which actually tells you a lot of these techniques, is a movie called Waking Life, um, which was um, um, a movie by Richard Linklater. Um, and in the movie, you have a character who doesn't know whether he's awake or asleep. And he keeps asking people. To help him and there are all these talking heads and experts who try to describe these things but one of the things I've been told is to look at your hands uh, which sounds a strange thing to do in a dream but if you look at your hands you'll suddenly think to yourself why are you looking at your hands and then you'll think oh because I decided to do so because when I'm dreaming I need to look at them and then you'll think so am I dreaming now and suddenly you'll become so... I've never been able to do it, by the way. I can't do this, but this is what I've been told. And you suddenly become aware of the fact you're in a dreamscape. In the movie Inception, the central character has something that's called a totem, which is an object that you, you take with you into the dream world. For instance, I don't know if you've seen the movie. He has a little spin, mm -hmm. spinning top, and he knows that if the spinning... He spins the top, and he knows if the top does the top, does not topple it's it's holding up it's easy right. dreamscape this is a similar technique another one apparently is to switch a light on and off you see a light switch and you switch it off and of course it won't turn off because you can't manifest it in this way and again it makes you become lucid but once you do i you know uh, i deal with this in the book that you you are in this world this illusionary created world that you can you can fly within you you can interface with people you can do all kinds of things but the fascinating thing is who is the choreographer of that world um a friend of a friend of mine who lives in manchester here in the uk mark mark regularly lucid dreams and he goes to the same place and he wanders around this cityscape and he's always said to me, he said, when I'm walking along the street and I turn a corner, there's a place there that has been created from my mind that I'm in. And he said, it clearly is a real place. It's not part of my imagination. It's structured. It has an inner logic to it. And it's always the same. Now, Robert Wagner made a wonderful example uh, in his book on lucid dreaming. Um, Robert describes once flying over a group of people wearing tall hats. And he thought it was so amusing, he decided that he'd knock a couple of the hats off. And he goes along and he knocks a few of them off, and he gets towards this guy wearing a top hat. And as he tries to push the hat off, the guy's hands come up and hold the hat on. Now, as Robert says in his book, that implied that that being knew what I was about to do and tried to stop me doing it. In which case, as, as Robert has said many times now, 
when you're in these dreamscapes, you encounter other people who are also dreaming. And you can tell sometimes the people who are dreaming because they look slightly confused. And you can talk to them and you can you can bring back the ridicule information because the person will contact you afterwards. And Robert gives an example of this where the person will remember the dream and seeing you in their dream in the same circumstances. Now, if that's the case, we have a really fascinating thing to come to terms with. Because the only reason that you and I believe that this universe that we are in at the moment is consistent and real is that we both agree about the things we see. We go to sleep tonight and you wake up tomorrow morning and your room is still effectively the same. This is consensual reality. And this is why we believe it's real. However, if somebody else can share your dream with you, that's consensual as well. So therefore, that is just as real. Now, there's a guy called Robert um, uh, um, Tom Campbell, who's written a series of books called My Big Toe. And Tom Campbell worked with a guy called Robert Monroe, who was a very, very famous person who astral traveled. And again, um, Tom in his books mentions many, many times where he shared lucid dreams with his son and they traveled together and went to places. Which then begs the question. Is this life a dream? Because, you know, I said that time can dilate and we all know in dreams, time expands. You know, you can have a dream that will take hours that in real, the real world will take a couple of seconds. Imagine that your whole life is a dream from the moment of your birth to the moment of your death, in which case the world would be consistent and you would go effectively to sleep in your dream world and wake up and the dream world would still be the same. Because it would be. So in other words, the consistency we believe is consistent is only because we believe that time exists and that we are, that this is the only thing that there is, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And this, um, okay, sorry, yeah. No, go ahead. And this is what then leads me into my next book, which, uh, because at the end of the Out of the Body Experience book, I pull together a hypothesis which I call the intramatic model. And I believe that what is happening when people astral travel, when people lucid dream, when people distance view, what they're actually doing is, is effectively traveling in inner space. They're actually traveling in alternate realities within themselves. In that, what I'm suggesting is that the human brain itself has structures in it called microtubules. Microtubules are very, 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 very bits, small pieces of protein that are the structures that make up the structures of the neurons of the brain. These very, very tiny structures give off um, light. They give off, they're bioluminescent. They give off photons of light. Not only that, but they're, they're actually strange. Like Sorry about this. It's all right. I see somebody desperately trying to get through to me. Um, that the, 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 the biophotons um, are given off by the sides of these particular structures. And again, without going into the depth of the science, if you actually take a series of photons from one place to another and you, you pull them together, they, call what's called, they cause what's called an interference pattern. Now, interference patterns are the things that uh, if you use coherent light, like a laser, and you create an interference pattern, you create something called a hologram. And we in our brain have literally trillions of these structures, all creating mini holograms. Now, what I argue is, is that internally, and the external world that you're seeing now, is in fact a hologram created by your mind. Because if you think about it, you never interface with the real world first time. In other words, the photons come from the outside world, they hit the back of your eye, the retina, and when it goes through the retina, it's then converted into an electrical impulse that goes uh, through something called the supercosmic, um, the supercosmic something or other on the inside of the, uh, the, the, the brain, then goes to the, um, the, um, the visual area of the brain, and it reconstructs reality. Now, 
If you look around the room now, and you look at your computer screen and everything else, and you look out the window, you have this incredibly ornate, rendered version of reality. Think about this for a second. That is being created by photons landing on the back of your retina in a tiny postage stamp size area that's curved and bent. Your brain creates from that everything you perceive. It's a magic trick of the highest order. And you talk to people who research on, on what's called consciousness studies and perception studies, they haven't got an idea how this works. They really don't know how we create all this. For instance, one of the things that's very intriguing, if you close one eye now, you still think you're seeing everything without a break. Okay? But you will know that at the back of your eye, there is a little area where the optic nerve leaves the back of the eye, called, and that's the blind spot. So when you close one eye, there is an area of blindness, but you don't see it. And the reason you don't see it is the brain makes up the information from the pieces of information around the blind spot and fills it in. Now, I spoke to uh, an optician about this a few years ago. And he turned around, this is a professional, and he turned around and he said, no, the reason that you don't see the blind spot is that you have two eyes and you have binocular vision. And therefore, when you look at things, it overlaps. And I turned around to him and I said, so what happens when I close one eye then? And he looked at me stunned. He'd never thought <laughs> about it. That had never dawned upon him. He just took the received wisdom that so many people do out there. They never sit back and think for a second the wonder of what's happening in their brain. So you have this recreated universe. And I believe that these microtubules draw this information up from something called the zero point field. Now the zero point field Put it simply, what they have found is that if you take um, atoms and you, you take them down to a temperature just above absolute zero, 272.17 degrees Kelvin, at that temperature, effectively, there should be no real energy because that's the definition of absolute zero. It's where the, the, the energy disappears within, within atoms. They just stop because there is no sure. energy, okay? They have found that they can reduce things to around about one or two, maybe three degrees above absolute zero. These objects, there's a particular form of, of uh, helium, I think, I think it's helium-3, that still remains as if it's got energy in it. It's drawing energy up from somewhere where there should be no energy. Now, this is called the quantum vacuum. And people are so interested in this at the moment. There is an organization in Boulder in Colorado that has got um, authority from the U.S. government to be trying to find ways and means of actually drawing up this energy from this zero point field. Now, they believe that the zero point field is a limit, unlimited amount of energy there. But this en energy is encoded. It's digital. Now, it means that effectively it's a super duper hard drive. It's a super duper computer program. A guy called Irvin Laszlo, uh, Professor Irvin Laszlo, who honored me by writing the uh, foreword to my last book. And in fact, Irvin Laszlo has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize twice. And right. Irvin wrote the foreword. And Irvin has written a book called uh, The Akashic Field. And in this, he postulates that the zero point field and zero point energy are the equivalent of the old mystic belief system of called the Akashic Record. The idea that there is somewhere that that everything that has ever happened and ever will happen is recorded. Now, going back to our computer game analogy, isn't that what is happening with the the computer? Isn't that then the world of the, the sprite on the screen? the avatar right. screen, as far as they are concerned, all the information for their world is encoded on the CD-ROM, isn't it? So everything you yeah. make Lara do is encoded on the CD-ROM. I think in this reality, everything that we do is encoded within the zero-point field. 
in which case we are in a computer program. In fact, there's so much evidence to assume it is more likely that we are existing in a computer program than not. Uh, in fact, there's been quite a, a lot of research done on this very idea, and there have been papers written on the concept. So suddenly, the ideas about the matrix are suddenly not so far-fetched. Suddenly, we are living in a universe that suddenly makes sense. And ironically enough, do you want to know a nice little coincidence? You know the way the corner of Skype comes up, and it tells you who you know that's online? Uh, right. Professor Irvin Laszlo has just come online on Skype. Synchronicities. It's we, I, we, I call it synchronicity. It's not <laughs> synchronicity, but it's significant synchronicities that mean something. Um, and that's the kind of thing that happens with us Atladians all the time. It just happens. We get used to it. So here we have an overall model of how, how dreams work, how reality works, how perception works. But my next book is going to take it to a whole different level because I believe that the, the substance in the brain that facilitates this communication is an endogenous, that is, internally generated dimethyltryptamine, which is generated by the pineal gland in the brain. Mm -hmm. And I, I was actually going to ask you, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but sorry. what is the relationship between uh, this glutamate that you mentioned and DMT? Because I thought it was DMT that uh, released at the time of death, or I thought that was the speculation that, at the that, time. The that is the, 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 the position put forward by Rick Strassman. Uh, and I've got no reason to question that. When my initial model, when I pull my initial model together, and I always say to people, this, this is um, a work in, in progress. This is not a definitive. In other words, I'm finding and discovering things over the last 10 years that I always incorporate into the ideas. I reject other things that suddenly don't make any sense anymore because it's not. I'm not being doctrinaire on this. Um, you know, effectively... It's an ongoing hypothesis. Now, initially, glutamate seemed to be the main cause of this and the time slowing down. But I'm more coming to the conclusion that it may actually actually be dimethyltryptamine. Um, and I'm doing a considerable amount of research on this. I'm talking to some of the world's leading experts on dimethyltryptamine. Um, there's a whole list of them of individuals who have either researched it directly have gone down to Latin America and taken ayahuasca, um, have gone on DMT trips, or have literally calculated the neurological pathways and the neurochemical pathways within the brain. Now, the case is quite strong, um, because although people will argue that they've never actually found dimethyltryptamine in the brain, that's not entirely true. They have found dimethyltryptamine, but in a dead brain. Dimethyltryptamine does exist within the body, but it's whether it's active within the brain. Because they have found as well, there are, there are a group now of um, receptor cells in the neurons of the brain called the TARS, the trace amine something receptors. And these receptors are designed, they are like keys, none of are like locks. And the design of the lock mirrors the key of dimethyltryptamine. Because dimethyltryptamine, being a, being a tryptamine, has a particular um, molecular structure. And this molecular structure is very similar to serotonin. It's very similar to melatonin, because these are all tryptamines. So therefore, DMT can actually open up neurological pathways in the brain. So in which case, if DMT is generated within the brain, the structures are already there for it to be effective. It is just a question of us now discovering whether, whether this is actually accurately true. And there is strong evidence to say that it is. Now, as you know, dimethyltryptamine is effectively one of the most powerful hallucinogenic drugs known to man. It has a cousin, 5-MeO-DMT, which is even more powerful. It's about six times stronger. And maybe 5-MeO-DMT is, is also in the brain. Uh, and I know a guy called James Oroch has written a wonderful book called Tryptamine Palace where he discusses this. But on top of this, this gets stranger because there is also another writer called Jeremy Narby. And a few years ago, Jeremy Narby wrote a book called The Cosmic Serpent. And in The Cosmic Serpent, Jeremy Narby, who is a, has got a doctorate in anthropology, suggests 
from some of the ayahuasca dreams he had that were consistent, many, many people see snakes as part of the ayahuasca dream. It's almost a standard, it's an archetype. Yeah. The snakes are DNA. It's DNA coils. And not only that, if you look at the caduceus, you know, the kind of symbol of medicine where you have the snakes going round. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, you look at the top. There's a pineal gland at the top, and the snakes go round the top. This is symbolic, and it's symbolic of the third eye, of the pineal gland, but it's also symbolic of DNA. And I believe, and a lot of other researchers, such as Jeremy Narby, such as uh, Graham Hancock, are of the impression that DNA itself is intelligent. And the reason they believe this is fascinating. Because one of the major mysteries of ayahuasca is how the, uh, the um, natives of the Amazon basin managed to bring together and mix together two very different plants. Banisteriopsis capi and something called Psychotropia something or other. They're two very different plants and they both have very, very different effects. For instance, the uh, banisteria, uh, the, the, the psychotropia contains DMT. Okay, but you can eat as many and drink or mash these leaves together and eat as many and drink and uh, make a liquid out of them and drink as many of them as you like, and you will never ever have a DMT experience. Right. The reason being, in the stomach is something called the MAO inhibitor, the mono uh, mono ox, mono I mean, oxidase. Something oxidase. Yeah. yeah. And as you know, that, that effectively, that enzyme stops DMT being effective. However, the a constituents of the Banisteriopsis capi, the vine, if you mix them together, the, the contents of the vine nullifies the effect of the MAO in the stomach, which allows the DMT to then go through the stomach wall into the bloodstream and into the brain. How was it that these people, by complete and utter chance, there are 80,000 species of plants in Amazonia, at least, they managed to find the two plants. And I was told last night by another person I was doing a radio interview with that these two plants aren't even geographically close together. They were asked by researchers as to why they were able, why they came to this conclusion. They said the plants told them. They said the shamans who don't need DMT or ayahuasca to go into altered states of consciousness communicated with the plants and the snakes. And they told them, this is what you need to do. Bring these two things together. This is DNA trying to communicate to one of its creations to actually become more self-aware of itself. Because if DMT is within the brain, DNA itself wants us to evolve sufficiently to open up the DNA portal and the, uh, the dimethyltryptamine portal within the pineal gland. Now, the pineal gland itself um, is a very intriguing structure. It is the only structure that's within the brain, although technically it's just outside the blood-brain barrier, that is not duplicated. Complicated. As you probably know, the two amygdala, the two hippocampi, but the pineal gland is not. It's singular and it sits almost in the center of the, the skull. Now, what is less known is that at the 49th day of gestation, the embryo, as it's developing, the pineal gland is actually at the back of the throat. And it's only after the 49th day that the pineal gland starts to move from the back of the throat to the center of the brain. And as it does so, it leaves a very, very tiny duct. Now, there is something that people experience um, when they go into very, very deep trance states. It's called the, the nectar of sublime awareness. And it's a, a nasty taste that people have when they go into altered states of consciousness, when they're, they're yogas or whatever yogis or whatever. It's DMT. What is happening is the DMT is dripping down the back of the throat from the duct, from the DMT gland, from the, the pineal gland into the back of the throat. Now, Buddhists believe that um, the embryo becomes human 
or the soul enters the embryo on the 49th day of gestation. Now, that in itself is a phenomenal coincidence. That's when the pine right. starts to move. But it gets weirder. Um, if you go onto my website and if you look at um, one or two videos out that are, that are on, about me on YouTube, you will find that I'm working with two Austrian um, consultants. One's a consultant neurologist, another one's a consultant psychologist. And these two guys have invented a machine called the Lucid Light Device, locally known as Lucia. As medical people, they have devised this device using known knowledge of neurology and how the brain functions with different forms of light and stroboscopic light. This machine is powerful. I have used it, and believe me, and I haven't got time to explain it now, but it opened my own third eye. I couldn't believe that these things had never happened to me, but it did it for me. But the, what is interesting wow. is, and if we have time, I will explain that, but what is interesting is, is that in May of three years ago, Dr. Prokol and Dr. Winkler took a Lucia over to Larsa in Tibet. And they were invited over there by members of the Dream Yoga tradition. This is, this is a, a, a particular form of yoga that's practiced by people of the Bon tradition. Now, the Bon tradition is the original shamanic belief system of the Tibetan plateau. When Buddhism came up from the plains of India, being very syncretic, it actually took on board the shamanic tradition of the Bon. So the Bon still believe a lot of shamanic things as well as normal um, Buddhism. These guys, they dream travel. Dream yoga is traveling. It's lucid dreaming, in effect, for want of a better term. And that's what they do. They astral travel and they lucid dream. These guys spend years being trained. These guys sat in front of the lucid light device and within 20 minutes were seeing mandalas, were, were having sensations of moving outside of their body, everything that their training had done. So clearly it was vindicated with the practitioners of this particular art. But what was odd was a couple of days later, Engelbert and Dirk were wandering around the, the palace they were in. And they came across a little room and they went into the room and inside were glass cases. And inside glass cases were these really strange objects. And because Dirk is a neurologist, he recognized them. They'd been there for centuries. They were ossified, mummified elephants, pineal glands. These people yeah. worship the pineal gland. They have known for centuries the power of this particular object in the brain. Now, you then start looking at the symbolism of the pine cone. And when you realize that the pineal cone, pineal gland is called the pineal because it resembles a pine cone, mm -hmm. and you look at the pine cone symbolism, you find it everywhere. There's a huge pine cone in the Vatican. Yeah, and on the staff of the, the, uh, staff the, Pope, of the Pope, too. But on well, let me ask you a quick question about that. Yeah. Um, do you think that as far as the Western culture is concerned, the overwhelming denial of these alternative subjects uh, and the, even like the banning of the psychedelic experience, do you think these things are by design, by, say, manipulation of a shadowy global elite like David Icke would suggest? Um, or do you think these, this is just a natural progression of human thought that we're just not there yet? Because a lot of these ancient cultures – seem to already have this in the bag, and then science is now confirming what they've already believed. I, I'm, I'm in two minds about this. I mean, I, I am in contact with David Icke, um, and David Icke actually placed um, one of my BBC, a film of me in a BBC interview, actually on his website. And he, nice. And he, he's keen to contact me and, and do some collaborative work. Um, I don't go as far as David. I'm, I'm not somebody who is in you do. theory. I don't. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's that could be through sheer ignorance, I have to say, because th there does seem to be um, a, a kind of symbolism of this thing. For instance, on the back of the one dollar note, when you see the all seeing eye um, in the center of the pyramid and the way in which the pyramid is detached into two parts. This is Masonic symbolism. Now, clearly to me, secret societies have known about this, and I think secret societies have always, already all, also known about my Damon Adelon stuff. 
because I think that has been one of the hidden secrets for centuries. I believe that's what the Holy Grail is, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not the bloodline of Christ. It's, it's the fact that we are dual beings. But that's an aside. But, you know, if you think about it, you know, for social control, what you don't want is people realizing that this reality we live within is not part of the total reality. It is a very small part of a greater reality that you can go inward and discover. Because, of course, social control and, and capitalism would fail because suddenly we are not going to be consumers of television sets. You know, I'm sure that um, Dennis McKenna and, and, and others have actually said this, that the consumer society needs us to, to consume things to keep us entertained. But if, if, if I'm able to entertain myself, I don't need a television. I can go actually traveling astrally to all these wonderful places. And the problem is economies would collapse because, of course, nobody would be consuming anything. And somebody has to prepare the food and do all these other things to keep us going. So I don't really know. I would, I would like to believe that it is, it's more by, by happenstance than actually specifically wanting to keep people down. And the reason I say this is I'm being allowed to get away with talking about this. You know, and people that many friends of mine who are into conspiracies have said, you have been noticed. You will be noticed and you will be taken out soon because you're getting very, very close to the truth. Now, what is intriguing, and I have to say this, is that I have a concept called the Archons, which is going back to Gnostic belief systems. That you know, there are beings out there that are out to stop you doing things. Because it is bizarre that many of my radio programs that I've been doing, particularly in the last week, some of them have failed to function because Skype has gone down or there's been these incredibly weird and wonderful things that have stopped it happening. Now, I think that's chance, but associates of mine are saying it's not chance. They're now spotting you and they're trying to actually stop you talking about things. So I don't know, but I would say, well, why do they allow me to talk about it? Why do they allow David Icke to talk about things? Right. You know, why do they like Will, allow Wilcock to talk about the things he does? You know, clearly, if they are, they're playing a very, very deep game you know i agree i mean well that's another thing like a lot of alternative researchers refer to that uh twin slit particle wave experiment um and they consider it evidence that we can alter and create our own experience manifesting at will whatever you want uh which i personally have a hard time with and it's it just seems too good to be true you know like you talk about the astral projection there's no reason to watch television if you could just do that um but it, obviously, it can't be that easy, but as far as the manifesting your own reality, uh, from what I've heard, you seem to stop short of saying that you can do it that easily. You can't. I don't think you can, but I suspect there are people that can do it, and they keep it secret. I believe that there are probably people who are more advanced than we are in these things and have been trained to do it, um, avatars for want of a better term. And I think these people are probably people who have lived their lives over and over and over again till they've actually lived the perfect life. They're allowed to move on to um, analogously the next day with, with Groundhog Day. You know, at the end of Groundhog Day, he lives the perfect life and something right. allows him to move on. And I think that certain people, if you look into Buddhism and, and various other religions like that, they will argue that you can be reincarnated and reincarnated to become an avatar. And then you can choose to either move on or come back and help your fellow human being. Things. Now, maybe there are guys out there that can do that, but coming back to your very, very interesting point about the twin slit experiments and the nature of reality and reality being brought into existence by the act of observation, you know, I've always found when I've dealt with particle physicists, particularly materialist reductionist ones, all you need to do to get them actually spitting into their beer and panicking like mad is to turn around and say the observer effect, because right. they can argue till the cows come home. But a wave is a wave until it is measured and it becomes a point particle. You know, that is a known fact. You know, they can't get away from that. And it seems to be integrally tied up with the act of observation. Now, this means, in effect, that if you if it's something is not being observed, it's technically in a state of superposition where it hasn't decided where to be located. In other words, it has the option to be a subatomic particle can be anywhere. But effectively, when it's observed, it has to make a decision to be in a point place somewhere. And it can be anywhere. Because recently, they found something called the quantum Zeno effect. And it effectively, subatomic particles, if you continue to look at them, 
they don't collapse, even though they should. You know, and again, I say to people, don't believe me on this. Just look up the quantum Zeno effect. It's one of the most amazing things you will ever hear. But it's never backed around on the newspapers. It's never talked about on the BBC or on the national radio or television for a very good reason. Because they want people to believe in the science as it was 110 years ago. They want us to believe in Newtonian science, which is a very effective way of describing the reality we live in now. The reality of, 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 of large things. But for subatomic particles, it doesn't work. And these are the things that make up the universe around us. And it's 99.999% empty space. And most of it is missing. You know, 94% of it is dark, dark matter. What's all that about? Yeah. Right. Crazy stuff. Yeah. I mean, I find, you know, the more I get into this, the more information, I feel it's like a huge um, crossword puzzle. And the pieces are just falling in. I mean, when I experienced the, the events that took place for me in, in Switzerland three years ago, when I encountered the lucid light device, I cannot and I still cannot believe what happened to me. I saw the astral plane. I have never had any kind of experience like that. The lucid light device encoded into my brain. I believe it then released dimethyltryptamine in my pineal gland. And I had an experience that I was somewhere else looking down on a planet with a checkerboard pattern. I got so terrified, wow. I asked them to switch the device off. I really got so scared. It was powerful. Have you tried it again since? No, I haven't. But ironically enough, if anybody, any of your listeners out there are likely to be in London uh, the last weekend of June and the last few days of June, um, we have a lucid light device that's coming over from Austria that will be with the four days uh, at the uh, Mind, Body and Spirit exhibition in London's Earl's Court. And people will be allowed to use this machine for free. And on the Sunday, I'll be doing a presentation um, on the, my linking to, 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 to these guys' work because it is powerful stuff. But the odd thing I found was that after I used the device, within 20 minutes, there was a vibration in the center of my forehead, which I could not explain. And it continued all through the night. And it was like a small little creature was moving underneath the center of my forehead where Indian women were, that little dot. It right. just there. And since then, it, it reoccurs occasionally. But what is even weirder is since then, something else has manifested in my life that I don't understand. I keep hearing Morse code signals. Um, and they seem to be located in certain parts of the world. For instance, in my original home on Merseyside near Liverpool, I heard them regularly. It used to wake me up. I'm hearing, you know, harp, H-H-A-R-P. Yeah. It's that. Um, I'm picking up harp. Yeah. What's your impression of harp? There's a lot of theories about what it's for, whether manipulation or affecting consciousness. Well, all I can say is that I'm pretty damn sure I hear it. And we tested this out. Now, again, if anybody's interested on this, again, if you go on to YouTube, Look up Anthony Peake and BBC. You will get me lie, me, me being recorded on a radio station with a film crew with me. And I'm talking about harp. This is what David Icke picked up and put on onto the front of his, his website because I described there in detail exactly what I'm hearing. Now, we found that there's a harp facility on the island of Anglesey, which is about 20, uh, 30 or 40 miles away from where I used to live. I've just come back from Mauritius in, in the South Indian Ocean. I heard nothing, not a thing. Where I live now, I very occasionally, very, very occasionally, one night in a month, I'll hear it. Up on Merseyside, I was hearing it every night. And it started at the same time, around about four o'clock, and it finished at 20 past four. Now, people have said it's tinnitus. I get tinnitus. I know what tinnitus sounds like. It sounds like Morse code. It's not, but it sounds like it. Now, is this because my third eye has been opened? Is it because I'm now perceiving signals that I couldn't normally perceive? Other people have said I'm being targeted. And I said, don't be stupid. Why the hell <laughs> would they be doing that? So I don't believe that for one minute. So there's an awful lot to this. And all I say to people out there is get involved with my work. I'm on Facebook. There's www.anthonypeak.com. I also have an international forum, which is cheatingtheferryman.com. 
all these links can be can be met but link up with me on facebook uh join in we have people from around the world that are taking these ideas to the most amazing places thousands of people this is a real groundswell movement and it's building up and it's building up this is the this is the fifth interview i've done in four days um both to america and to the uk this really is picking up picking up massively and it's yeah it's, it has a truth to it sure it's fascinating stuff do you think this in any way um ties into 2012 with the awakening that you know the new age movement supposedly says is taking place I'm, and ties into the uh collapse of the global economic system which is kind of coincidental that it's at this i'm time. i'm not a great believer in 2012 and i think an awful lot of people who are uh pointing out the 21st of the 12th 12 is going to be some kind of significant date i think it's very dangerous to be making such predictions because it's going to be profoundly embarrassing when nothing happens. Sure, um, when, when I was at university, I studied millenarian religious movements. And the whole point of millenarian religious movements is they predict the end of the world. The one thing that has been consistent or a great change, the one thing that's been consistent with all those movements is they've all been wrong. Uh, of course. And I think there's going to be an awful lot of embarrassed people when it doesn't happen. Of course, if it does happen, I'm going to be proven wrong. Now, <laughs> um, I really don't know. I really don't know about this. Um, clearly, there is there is something happening. And I think there is an opening of of awareness in people. I'm perceiving it when I do my lectures. More and more people are becoming interested in this. And I think humanity is splitting into two groups. It's the groups that really want to carry us forward in a more dynamic, dare I say, more spiritual way and, and bringing together spirit, spiritual beliefs and science in, a, in, in an amalgamation that can take us forward. Mm. And there are those people that are tenaciously tying themselves in knots, trying to explain a universe that cannot be explained by basic Newtonian physics. And, you know, they're the ones that are desperately out of, the, out of place. They are the ones that are making the mistakes that scientists made 110 years ago before Einstein came along and before Max Planck came up with his theory of the quantum of energy. They thought they knew everything, but they didn't. They had problems. They had um, issues with black body radiation. They had problems with the photoelectric effect. These things did not fit in. They were black swans. They didn't fit in. We have black swans now superposition the observer effect the, the the binding problem in the brain the hard problem that david chalmers says as to how inanimate neurochemicals can bring about you and i with inner lives and memories you know i'm not a collection of neurochemicals and electrical impulses that happen to think i'm anthony pig you know i'm not i'm more of an agreement with Tyhard de chardin that i'm actually a spiritual being having a physical life sure Right. <laughs> Crazy stuff, man. That pretty much brings us to the top of the hour. So, I mean, my brain is pretty much out of juice for the day. I uh, fry everybody's brains, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I'm super grateful. Uh, one more time, where should people go to get your books and keep up with your work? Right. Okay. My books, you can get my books in most bookshops across the United States and Canada. Uh, you, if you can't, if the bookshops haven't already got them in, you can order them from the bookshops. You can order them on Amazon. UK, Amazon USA, Amazon Canada. Uh, you can also, if you wish, go onto my website, anthonypeak.com, uh, and look at the books for sale if you want me to send you um, personal signed copies. And I charge the same as the, the, the bookshop price, not Amazon price, but bookshop price, and just post and packing. Um, that, and by ordering the books that way, you really do help me keep going. Um, so if you want to order the books, that's fine, and I'll send copies out to you. But you can get them anywhere. You can also get them on Kindle. Um, in fact, my new book um, is already charting on Amazon in the UK. It got to number one in the parapsychology section on Kindle two days ago, and it only came out three days ago. Um, so just join in. Read the books. Give me your opinions. If you think it's a load of rubbish, tell me. Um, because that's what it's all about. I'm not a guru. I'm just an ordinary man. <laughs> Dominance. Well, 
Thanks, Pip, and uh, keep exploring the Infinite Abyss. Come back anytime. There's so much more to talk about. Anytime you want me back, I'm more than happy to. I can go for hours. There's so much into this. Sure. Well, thanks so much. Okay. Have a good day. Okay, Greg. Bye. People, that is the show. Do with it what you will. Please hop over to conspiracies.net or click the banner on the thehiresidechats.com and take a swift and vigilant Anthony peek at the first couple designs from my new t-shirt line. And if you use the coupon code HIRESIDE, you'll get 15% off, and I'll be one step closer to happiness. Boom!